Hi, welcome back to physics teaching. This has to be one of my all-time favorite problems from the Sir Isaac Newton contest, which is the high school physics contest from Marlin University. Give it a try, and I'll be right back with the solution. All right, so in this question, we have a ball that's thrown or rolled off of a cliff going horizontally with a speed of 20 meters per second. That means its initial y speed, let's call that v0, is 0 meters per second. And it's going to fall, and then right here, when it hits, it's going to bounce, and its vertical velocity instantly reverses and decreases by 20%. And then it asks how far, or what is the range of this projectile. Now a lot of the times students will say, well, if it keeps reducing by 20%, it'll never actually reach zero, and therefore its range has no limit. But this is the incorrect answer. As we'll see in this question, um, that an infinite number of bounces can have a finite limit for how far it goes. So let's start by analyzing this first drop right here. So in the first drop, since the initial velocity is 0, let's call the final velocity in y v1. Because uh, we're mostly going to analyze just all the y components for most of this problem. All right, so we can use the equation that um, our displacement in y, let's just call it delta y, which is our height here is equal to the initial velocity times time plus one half um, acceleration times time squared. And I'll have displacement and acceleration. I'll leave them as positive because it's just easier if I make down to be our positive direction. All right, the initial velocity is zero, so this term is just going to disappear. And we can rearrange this to solve for time. Let's specifically call this delta t1. So from here to here, we will call this delta t1. So if we solve for delta t1, we get it as the square root of 2 times that height, delta y, all over the acceleration a, which we know is acceleration due to gravity, 9.81 meters per second squared, so I'll just call that g. Now I can also solve for that final velocity. So let's call that v1, which I've already done. And that's going to be equal to this equation, where we have um, initial velocity plus a delta t. And that's delta t1. Initial velocity, again, is 0. Right? And so we're left with just v1 equaling to a, which is g, times delta t1. All right, next let's analyze this second bounce here. Not second bounce, but a second parabola for its trajectory. And let's call this point A. Uh, we'll do point B at the peak of that trajectory, and then point C where we reach our second bounce. So right at the beginning we have V2, and it's important to note that V2 is less than v1 by exactly 20%. So I can write v2 as 80% of v1 or just 0 0.8 times v1. And since I know v1 is g times delta t1, I can write this as 0 0.8 times g delta t1. All right, so I want to analyze between the points a and b from the bottom to its peak. So between those two points, I can say that the acceleration is its final velocity at the peak, which is actually zero in the y-coordinate, minus that initial velocity, v2, over the time. So what are we going to call the time? This was delta t1. So let's call from a to c, we'll call that delta t2. And since this um, is a level plane. Right here at B 
is exactly halfway. Maybe not in my diagram, but it is halfway. And so we can say this is one half of delta t2. Now if we rearrange this, don't forget our vector signs, we arrange this, we have one half delta t2 is going to equal to, uh, here we have negative v2, but v2 is actually up and I labeled down as positive. So I'm going to pull out its directional property. And so we get a double negative. And so we're just left with a positive V2 divided by A, which is G. All right, so let's continue this. So solving for delta T2 then, well, multiply both sides by two. So we get two. And then I know V2 is up here. So it's two times 0 0.8 g times delta t 1 just squeeze that in there all divided by g so our g's are going to cancel and we just get delta t 2 is equal to 2 times 0 0.8 times delta t 1. now you can repeat this same process for the next parabola and the next parabola and the next parabola. So if you were to label this as V3, and this would also be, um, here you would have V2, uh, the magnitudes would be the same because again, it's level ground. But then V3 would be exactly equal to 0 0.8 V2. And we know that V2 is exactly equal to 0 0.8 V1. So that just equals 0 0.8 squared times v1. And then similarly, if you were to follow this same process, you would get this time, which would be from here to here, and we can call that delta t3. Delta t3 would be equal to 2 times 0 0.8 squared delta t1. Similarly, delta t4 would be 2 times 0 0.8 cubed delta t1, and so on and so on and so on. So we have a pattern now we can follow. So following this pattern, we can say that the total time, let's call the total time capital T, is going to equal to delta t1, so the time for this first drop, plus delta t2, plus delta t3, plus delta t4, and so on, and so on, and so on, to infinity. All right, so delta t1, I can just write as delta t1. Delta t2 would be 2 times 0 0.8 delta t1. And then delta t3 would be 2 times 0 0.8 squared delta t1, and so on, and so on, and so on, to infinity. So what I can do here is, since there's a delta t1 in every single term, I can pull out a delta t1 and write that as 1 plus, so we have, this is our 1, and then plus, and every other term after that has a 2 in it, so I can pull out a 2 times, all times, 0 0.8 plus 0 0.8 squared plus 0 0.8 cubed and so on, and so on, and for, so on to infinity. So what I need to do here is solve this infinite series. So let's call the sum of this infinite series S. So S equals 0 0.8 plus 0 0.8 squared plus 0 0.8 cubed, and so on to infinity. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply s by 0 0.8. So 0 0.8 s. Well, that's going to equal, well, if we multiply the first term by 0 0.8, we get 0 0.8 squared. And I'm just going to write that over here. Just give myself a little space. And then the second term, multiply that by 0 0.8, and we get 0 0.8 cubed. And then 0 0.8 to the 4, and so on, and so on, and so on, out to infinity. Now, if I were to subtract these, so s minus 0.8s, well, s minus 0.8s is just 0.2s. And over here, you'll notice there's a pair. 0.8 squared minus 0.8 squared cancels. 
the cubes cancel and everything else will have a accompanying pair that we will cancel with. The only thing that is left over is this first 0 0.8. So now this is a simple equation I can use to solve for s. s is just simply going to be, if I divide both sides by 0 0.2, s equals 0 0.8 divided by 0 0.2, which equals 4. So that means this infinite series here has a finite solution. It equals 4. All right, so if I sub that back in here, I can solve for total time. So that simply equals delta t1 times 1 plus 2 times 4. All right, so that's 8 plus 1 is 9, so it just equals 9 times delta t1. Now, if you remember from before, we actually solved delta t1 to be the square root of 2 times delta y, which is our height, divided by g. So our total time is then equal to 9 times the square root of 2 times that height, which is 490, all divided by g, which is 9.81 meters per second squared. which gives us 90 seconds. So that's fascinating right there, because what that says is the sum of an infinite number of bounces occurs in a finite time of 90 seconds. I just love thinking about that. That's why this problem is one of my favorites. And once we have the time, the rest of the problem is fairly simple. We're simply going to go back and look at this x component. Because in projectile motion, um, not considering air resistance, that horizontal component of velocity never changes. Since we know the time that it's going to be bouncing along forever, we can say that that range, the displacement in x, is going to be the velocity in x times that total time. All right, so velocity in x is 20 meters per second, and total time is 90 seconds. So that's going to give us 1,800 meters. Our answer is C.